Okay, now it's time for questions. So um, if you want to add anything else, and uh, if not, the, the floor is, is yours. And we have the micro here. If you don't have any questions by now, because I, I guess that questions will be uh, coming. Um, maybe one question for the three of our speakers, uh, because the three of you have been doing connections between nowadays and, and, and uh, 68. And um, so a question for, for the three of you. In, in what extent uh, nowadays protests, let's say, in, in your countries, are based or, let's say, inspired in the 1968 demonstrations and demands and the programs of that time. You want to start, Mary? OK. Again, very interesting uh, uh, situation in Croatia right now, because uh, protests in 1968 in, in Yugoslavia were pro-Yugoslav. Uh, protests. They were pro-socialist protests and three years later in Croatia, in Zagreb University, uh, protests for Croatia and uh, so let's say very national, okay, uh, so uh, protests in 1971, uh, student protests in 1971 in Zagreb University, they were protests for I will try to maybe uh, simplify for independent Croatia and uh, not so Yugoslav and not so socialist. And in 90s, when Yugoslavia uh, <coughs> broke up, uh, those guys from 68, they were Yugoslavs. So they were enemies. And those guys from 1971, they were cr real Croatians. So uh, in this moment, in, uh, in Croatia, uh, there are no discussions or anniversaries of uh, official of 1968. There are some round tables where I'm participating and some my colleagues, but 1971 student protests, they are the key moment for, uh, for, for protesters. So that, that's, the, that's the, the huge, uh, uh, there's the difference and there's the reason why uh, 68 today in, in Croatia is uh, uh, not only w not well known, but it is, uh, um, let, let's say, anti-Croatian. It, 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 it's in a way, it, uh, uh, when, when you ask people, they'll say, oh, it, it was pro-Yugoslav. Yeah. Um, Yes, I think one of the major differences is um, there was a very clear enemy then in the case of Spain, which was Franco, and that unites different forces and different people from very different backgrounds. And perhaps today the other difference I find, of course, are the new technologies. Um, there everything was presential. Students went to the universities, even if they were closed, and. The police were there, and what we call the greys, but the secret police were also in the classrooms. But despite that, the clandestine ways of informing one another worked. Um, so I think that's a major difference, the ways of communicating about protests and sites of protest. I think that's, that, well, the, the social um, media today is, is totally different. And I think that leads to new forms of uh, social movements, of how people actually exercise protest, so I think that's one, one major, a second major one. Um, the, the, the first one I mentioned is that everything was very clear then, uh, the fight against Franco. It was also very clear, I think, by the young generation of students that um, we could change the world, the world could be changed, and that it was very important, the involvement of every person in it. Um, and the collective identity was extremely strong. Now we're in a society which is based on the individual, uh, individual interests. So the creation of a collective identity, a collective protest of identifying with others, I think that is um, another difference. Uh, it, it will come about eventually, but um, that notion of collective uh, protest, I think, was very um, 
entrenched in the mentality of the time, um, not just by younger students, but in general, the whole idea of social movements was based on, on that, I think. Um, so, yes, and, and uh, student movements today, well, they're, they're very, um, I would say, quite fragmented. Uh, if we speak about Catalonia, it would be one thing. We speak about other parts of Spain and the other. And, and a lot had to do, I'm, I'm thinking back, for example, uh, the introduction of Bologna, the Bologna model, that did uh, bring about a lot of student protests. Mm -hmm. But um, perhaps in a way that you mentioned earlier, um, the protests had to do with the university at the time, not with society, but, but maybe to some extent with the educational system. But they, they were, in, in, the six, in, the, in the 68, 70s, um, everything was immediately linked to whole of society mm. and values yeah. and change. Um, and then, of course, today in, in Catalonia, it's quite different. It's another um, collective action and another well, agenda, obviously. You know. So, yeah, there are changes. But I, and the world has changed from 68 to today, obviously. So I think that makes obliged changes as well. But just one, one, one uh, uh, sentence to add, sorry. Uh, when I'm comparing memories of uh, students in 1968 and when I'm looking and speaking with my students today, uh, I, uh, so it, today it's free democratic society in Croatia and that was, let's say, uh, one, it was um, one party dictatorship and so on. But students, young people then, it seems to me they were more optimistic and enthusiastic than those today. My students are so passive, so um, let's say uh, th they don't want to go somewhere to, to protest. It's, you know, maybe it is because uh, there is no clear enemy. Uh, so that, then it was, and right now I think it's, it's uh, everything is possible. And there is another thing, it was forbidden then. Now nothing is forbidden. You can go and say, oh, president is stupid. So what? But then it was maybe some motivation to, to, to go and to protest. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so uh, uh, there, are, um, there is many similarities. Uh, so many similarities. Okay, d despite the very fact that uh, there is no more um, communist dictatorship in Poland, so perhaps uh, those similarities are not that important because the, there is no more communist party to, to, to re re revolt against, uh, and we got freedom of press, freedom of speech, we got still democracy. Uh, Albeit as uh, some claim, uh, some claim somehow endangered. But the, uh, the similarities um, makes uh, it, there are jokes that um, to commemorate 1960, 15th anniversary of uh, 1968 in Poland, Polish authorities uh, um, uh, decided to to stage a reenactment of 1968 crisis in Poland these days, and to some extent, it's. Uh, it's true, I can explain briefly why. Because, um, you know, th there, are, uh, there, is many, th there are many angles, angles to that and there are many factories that, uh, that uh, creates those similarities. First of all, uh, the generation of uh, 1968 um, um, rebels, the, the generation of 1968 I was talking about, then uh, became the very important generation of Polish dissident movement and then then the, they mm, uh, uh, consist, uh, constitute, it, uh, constitute uh, the important part of uh, political elites in Poland after 1989, and they got its own grudges with current elites of uh, ruling uh, law and justice. Law and justice, because the generation 1968 were were mostly leftists, so they they were not liked. They were detested by the um, right Polish wing, right wing Polish parties. Uh, so the and probably some of you heard, some of you not. In 2015, in in Poland, uh, in parliamentary election, uh, parliamentary election uh, was won by Law and Justice, the nationalist conservative uh, rightist nationalist conservative uh, party, uh, which uh, started started uh, instantly to further the kind of national revolution in Poland. 
mostly uh, focused on uh, changing the uh, m uh, politics of memory. They pay m a lot of attention to politics of memory, law and justice, so this, uh, they put much emphasis on, on this aspect of uh, uh, of their um, agenda, they, they prioritized it in their agenda, the issues of history as, uh, as general, uh, which put them on the collision course with Israel and with uh, United States because of uh, very controversial law, controversial law um, uh, forbidding to mention um, uh, uh, Polish sins during the Holocaust, which uh, was a um, dead ringer of what happened in 1968. This is what I was talking about, uh, uh, the enemy of the foe. The picture of the enemy in 1968 uh, consisted mostly of, 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 of this uh, figure of uh, uh, people detesting Polish history. So once again, Polish government uh, uh, denounced people detesting Polish history because it was denouncing Polish historians speaking about some kind of Polish involvement in, uh, in Holocaust or involvement of some Poles. Uh, um, so it, it, uh, it happened that uh, those, uh, the, the conflict of 1968 uh, uh, reverberated once um, again in in, uh, in Polish society because the uh, current agenda of Polish government uh, triggered um, uh, uh, upset of anti-Semitism in Polish society against uh, uh, Jewish uh, historians who falsify Polish history who. Uh, um, uh, who, who tell lies about Polish history and so on. These are the, those phrases. Obviously, there are quotations here in my mouth. Uh, mm, and uh, on the other hand, there is the, the similarity of struggle between generation of 1968 and the government who is furthering uh, the nationalist agenda. These are the very... It's, ha it's hard to explain uh, clearly mm, uh, for people who doesn't live in Poland, but uh, in, from a Polish perspective, the similarities of uh, propaganda language, of press articles, mostly of the press that are uh, supporting uh, government and the right-wing parties, uh, they are really striking sometimes. It's like you cannot uh, tell the difference between the articles from 1968 and the contemporary article from Polish press. And there are obviously differences very important. There is no uh, student movement, uh, political student movement in Poland these days, and there is no students and youth revolt in, in Poland these days. And if uh, uh, youth are politically organized, they mostly support uh, ruling party and uh, it's very sad to say, but we witness a great surge of uh, neo-fascist movement in Poland, mostly consisted of, of young people. That's all. Also students? Also students, unfortunately, yeah. They are, they are very influential at the universities, the so-called National Radical Camp. It's a pre-war Polish organization, strictly uh, uh, fascist, which... Uh, 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 Enliven its its revival these days, and and uh, many people, young people, join their ranks, and uh, also from university, also students. La meva pregunta anava per aquí. Ho faig en català perquè si ho tinc després en anglès em perdré. Ja em perdré en català. Uh, jo no entenc que... De, uh, en aquests moments que està passant a Polònia. Eh, la derechització, la, eh, les dones al carrer en contra d'aquestes lleis. Hi ha algun, eh, alguna cosa històrica que no ens porti als 30 que, que expliqui què passa a Polònia, que no volen refugiats? És una vinculació... L'antisemitisme l'han canviat per l'antiislamisme. I què passa amb els drets de les dones? Perquè jo recordo que a la Unió Europea quan eh, eh, van començar a entrar els pecos, els països de l'Est, les dones estaven educades, havien treballat, tenien els nens a les guarderies i van copar unes de les posicions importants que a l'altra banda de les europees, Espanya, per exemple, ara ens hem discutit perquè si era una dona o no era una dona qui substituïa el ministre que s'ha anat al banc europeu. No? 
O sigui, les poloneses i les altres estaven preparades, estaven... Què passa? Què fan les dones a Polònia? El 50% de la població contra aquest règim que s'autoritza, que es posa molt autoritari, surten al carrer, però què més poden fer? Ell que és universitari, que és professor, que ens expliqui, sense les mentides que explica la premsa, què està passant a Polònia i si es pot parar això. Ok, I can try, but I don't understand truly speaking as well, so there are two of us, and I don't want to disappoint you, but obviously, we should, first of all, we should bear in mind that there are many factors involved, and there are... Uh, it's co uh, coincidence of many phenomena, many processes at the same time. The women protest against the new law. Obviously, it's a part of current political conflict within Polish society because uh, law and justice, ruling law and justice, somehow probably to cause it up to Catholic Church, they further the new, they propose the new uh, draconic, uh, very harsh anti-abortion law, next to Saudi Arabia, actually, something like that. It's, it's incredibly harsh, and it triggered women to oppose, even, uh, the, the, um, even women who didn't actually um, sympathize with uh, left or with uh, feminist movement. Simply the, the, the level of outrage was so great that uh, that it uh, triggered uh, demonstration uh, and it united women and it united Poles actually because uh, also m men took part in those demonstrations. Uh, m m personally, I d didn't take because I had to ta take care of kids while my wife went there. So, uh, but uh, but people were, were united um, against this new law because it was really draconic and. Uh, unhumanitarian, deeply unhuman, inhumanitarian. Mm. Uh, and on the other uh, hand, we have got this uh, revival of uh, political trends from the 30s, uh, which are somehow connected, obviously, to nationalist stance of c current government, nationalist uh, uh, pro-church stance of current government. It's uh, it's very similar to what was happening and what is happening still in Hungary, where we got uh, uh, rightist centrist uh, Fidesz and Jobbik to the very right, which uh, uh, is very com uh, uh, convenient for, for Orban and for Fidesz to uh, gain people's support uh, to present, uh, or uh, Fidesz is uh, in position to present themselves as the only defendant uh, against the um, neo-fascist movement. So law and justice sometimes uh, uh, tries to win those support from uh, neo-fascist movement. Sometimes they oppose neo-fascist movement, uh, presenting them, themselves as uh, the only boundary that, uh, uh, that could save country from falling into uh, into madness of, of fascism. Uh, I don't know why they are so popular, uh, the, the, why the neo-fascist movement is so popular. popular. Perhaps it didn't exist for so many years in Poland that, you know, it's simply the, the, the idea of changing social attitudes, the idea of sinusoid, that, that people sympathized, uh, were sympathizing with the left, and so now they are support the right. And uh, the mm, national radical camp uh, offers, uh, as it's usually for fascist movement, offers easy solution and uh, uh, know how to harness people's anger, people's uh, scare, people are frustrated, people are afraid. There is anti-Islamism mm, uh, anti in Polish society, very strong, which is uh, funny because we got no Muslims at all. So, uh, but there is strong anti-Islamism in Poland. I don't know why uh, it happened. Uh, I think it came from UK because Polish immigration to UK, uh, mm, uh, they, uh, they, um, have, uh, they had and they still have uh, many ties with Poland and they in UK became the citizens of the um, uh, second sort uh, 
so they they it was kind of competition with uh, um, Islam uh, a Muslim society within UK to uh, we are worse than uh, uh, native uh, British citizens but at least we have to be better than those uh, uh, migrants from the Far East so um, uh, so this is uh, this is probably the nature of anti-Islamism that was then transferred to Poland and here it found. I don't know, but the fertile ground in, in Poland. I could give a whole lecture on this, but I don't want to to, uh, to steal your time. So I hope I, 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 I was of some help here. The, lo the role of the church is always very important in Poland. It was very important in communist time because uh, Church served as a kind of asylum, asylum for uh, for people and even for dissident movement, uh, and the uh, persecution weren't that strong. So they uh, rather um, entrenched church than uh, make made it weaker. Uh, and now uh, church takes advantage of, of its merit in, uh, merits in communist time. Uh, and obviously it, it's the institution by itself with kind of totalitarian ambition. Sorry, I, I need to say that, but uh, uh, it's somewhere embedded in the very nature of, 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 of the religion to... to uh, to gain people and to, to impulse uh, its belief on the society. We've, we have got um, a small part of so-called open church, uh, which is open for dialogue and uh, um, inclusive, not, exclu not exclusive, but most of the church is very traditional, uh, rooted in, in the pre-war times with very traditional view of the social order of uh, men's and women's role, obviously against uh, gay marriages uh, uh, and uh, more or less strongly, still very strongly anti-Semitic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll direct this one to Mary Nash because um, it seemed that you were uh, arguing for a more pluralistic view of 68, and I was wondering uh, if you could talk maybe a little bit about uh, within Europe the uh, use of the memory of 68 and which countries are then included and which are not, um, because it seems like a very diverse, of course, uh, conception of 68 within the different countries. Uh, so I was wondering how the European Union is using this memory and if it's being used um, and if you see any changes or so in that use. The European un Union policies on that because this project is, is part of that, right? Um, well, first of all, I think, and, and this is a, an ongoing um, position and argument for the need to develop a counter-narrative to a hegemonic narrative on Europe. And, and I think this goes way back, not just from May 1968, but on probably other issues as well. And in this t uh, case, I think we're talking about power structures of center periphery that have not accounted on many occasions, for example, for the Mediterranean countries, or coming from Ireland, uh, I speak of that in terms of periphery, and I think this has been extremely fruitful and enriching, insightful, uh, just to see the differences there are. But then again, the problem is, or the question will be, what can we do about it? Shall we develop another European um, project on the development of counter-narratives? And there I would go back to Nancy Fraser and, uh, <coughs> and others on the politics of, of uh, recognition. And that, I think, is the major problem. Because we do have the studies, we do have uh, the publications in different languages. Um, if they're not published in English, then there is not a recognition of it. And so this, this is, uh, again, goes back to power structures, academic power structures, and the establishment of canons or even of concepts. And the conceptualization of, May, of, of 68 has been in terms of France, maybe UK, and has not 
um, taken into consideration uh, another understanding of it. Um, so uh, I don't think, uh, to my knowledge, um, uh, up to this point, that there has been a considerable effort uh, by the European Union uh, to recreate a narrative on May 68 or a narrative on European history, per se. And in that sense, I always go back to my beloved um, Said, Edward Said. Uh, I think that a lot of the uh, construction of uh, historical narratives has had to do with the other, the construction of the other in terms of the other, but within Europe, I argue, not re referring to Orientalism and the East or to colonial societies, but actually within Europe itself. And I do th th feel very strongly that we need, we need to address it. And this happens in all areas. It could happen in terms of women's studies or um, political history or cultural history, etc. And I, the, the difference now is, I think, that we do have the instruments to address that. Uh, what we need probably is um, political involvement and people like um, Jordi and Uriol to organize projects like this that will give a counter-narrative. But a counter-narrative that doesn't remain here, that doesn't remain in the drawer, that may be published in, e in English, but should be published in the major publishing houses. Because if it's not there, then there will not be recognition. I don't know whether I've answered your question, but there we go. Completely agree. <laughs> um, is there any more questions from the audience? One more. Yeah, I was wondering in the Polish uh, situation then, um, because you have this link of 68, which does have a huge recognition, it seems, being said March and then right away thinking 68. Um, I was wondering if sort of dissident movements now are that stem from that movement or are linked to that movement still experience the same anti-Semitism because of their supposed origin from that movement. Exactly. Oh, sorry. It was really strong, <laughs> strong voice. Yes, yes. Uh, I like that sense of strength. Um, yes, exactly. Um, uh, sometimes they are still the same people. So Adam Michnik is still a very influential person in Poland. He's editor-in-chief of the largest Polish uh, daily newspaper, Gazeta Wyborcza, which is strongly against law and justice. And obviously, they are uh, the, the ex-commandos, the, the people who uh, uh, belong to the commandos group I was talking about, are still under attack from uh, government because of their political involvement. And obviously, with reference to the same arguments, for instance, a few years ago, uh, the book came out entitled um, Minister, Ministerial Children. And it's hard to, 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 to translate, actually, but it was Resortowe Dzieci, Ministerial Children. It was about the elites of uh, uh, Poland after 1989 that, um, uh, uh, that have children of uh, communist uh, officials and communist establishment. It was uh, more or less far-fetched arguments there in the book because uh, uh, they, the authors tried to, to, to prove their thesis with very far-fetched uh, arguments and uh, uh, distorting uh, reality in many ways, but actually they um, they used the same arguments, the, exactly the same arguments that were used in 1968. These are children from communist, Jewish communist families. And even the same documents by secret police were used again after f f almost 50 years. They were the same, the same documents, the same quotations from the same documents about the Michnik's father or Blumstein's father or uh, gross uh, parents or something like that, pointing out uh, th that these are people that are uh, mm, external to Polish nation because they are of foreign origin and they never uh, could share the same values as true original Poles. So yes, the arguments are the same and this is the fact that obviously uh, mm, uh, 
raises strong response from the Polish center, for, from Polish left, from Polish intellectual uh, media, because people recognize the so-called March language, Język Marca. It's, it's uh, the, the, the very noxious mix, mixture of uh, uh, nationalism, uh, uh, false egalitarianism, uh, and uh, it could, people know it could end simply in dictatorship. <laughs> Bueno, una mica, parlaré en català, una mica va tant per al senyor clàssic com per la professora de Medinaix. El professor clàssic ha mostrat molta preocupació per l'apatia que en aquest moment mostra el jovent per moltes coses. És una preocupació que jo també tinc i em fa pensar en una cosa que vaig llegir, sento que cada vegada tinc menys neurones, no recordo l'autora de la frase, però sí el llibre en què el vaig llegir, que era de Neil Smith, on una professora nord-americana i activista en un moment donat davant de la classe s'interromp es posa molt trista i diu el pitjor de tot és que ja no tinc capacitat per imaginar la revolució. I jo crec que això és una mica el que ens passa, que el neoliberalisme ha invadit tot i som absolutament incapaços d'imaginar un món que no sigui el món que tenim. És una cosa que crec que no passava l'any 68. La professora Merinaix ha parlat de l'esperança que es crea i com que jo soc una mica filla d'aquell moment, puc dir que sí, que recordo aquells anys amb una immensa esperança, amb una alegria increïble i en un moment en què pensava que podia passar tot i que tot seria bo. És una cosa que des que va caure la URSS això no passa. La veritat és que no passa i la nostra joventut i almenys l'espanyola cada vegada té més preocupacions i unes preocupacions que li impedeixen, per exemple, a lo millor interessar-se per el que estem parlant avui. Això enllaça una mica també amb tot el que és la revolució feminista, que ha fet menció la professora Merinaig. Jo li volia fer una observació, no sé si ella ho compartirà, però jo he vingut veient que, en realitat, aquelles dones franquistes, que realment dius, mare de Déu, jo no vull aquest món ni de casualitat, no vull viure aquesta vida, però que en realitat si et fixes en altres països occidentals, després de la Segona Guerra Mundial és una mica el que es fa amb la dona. Hi ha tot un seguit de pel·lícules de propaganda que porta la dona fora de l'àmbit del treball cap a la vida domèstica. I per tant, potser Espanya sí que era molt pitjor que altres llocs, també perquè partíem d'uns nivells molt més baixos de participació femenina en el treball declarat, perquè la dona aquí ha treballat sempre, de manera legal o no legal, però sempre ha treballat. I això ho enllaçaria una mica, amb el que jo li demano la seva opinió, amb el canvi que s'ha produït, si tenim en compte, per exemple, la vaga mundial feminista del 8 de març, on justament a Espanya ha sigut el lloc del món on més dones s'han sortit al carrer i on més reivindicacions hi ha. I si realment ens hem alliberat d'aquest treball domèstic o aquestes noies que estan a la universitat magnífiques que acabo de veure quan entrava en realitat, quan viuen en parella, no de manera insensible i automàtica, no assumeixen elles totes una sèrie de tasques que en realitat són tasques de la parella. Gràcies. Gràcies. 
uh, the role of the students and the motivation of students. Yeah, sorry. Um, it was more comment than, than a question, and I really agree, and I don't have, I'm really not, uh, I think we need experts in psychology and soci sociology and uh, all other uh, fields um, to help us with that, why are they, or are they really apathic, or just, as Mary mentioned, they are active in other way. Uh, they are active in uh, virtual reality, they are not active uh, here, but uh, there are huge debates on forums, on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, so on. So maybe it's a different way of activism right now. Uh, it maybe doesn't, and I agree with you with this liberalism, and uh, I'm not agree with Fukuyama and his end of history, but you know, you, 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 uh, may, you, you made one answer, uh, so, uh, Fukuya Fukuyama's point was, okay, uh, there were three uh, ideologies, let's say, so it was uh, fascism, it was uh, communism, uh, it was uh, liberalism, and uh, communism was uh, uh, conquered, and fascism, and th there is only liberalism, and it, that's it. That's, so, we have everything uh, right now, and nothing more, and nothing new. So, uh, maybe it, it is, maybe you really answered it, so there, is, uh, there are shades and there are maybe just uh, different approaches, but uh, not crucial enemy or just we, we can't, or young people can't recognize the, 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 the real enemy. I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, I agree that we need a, lot, a wider panel of specialists in about the general question of apathy and, um, and pessimism. I think that the 68 generation were optimists despite the difficulties. And they, they had that idea that they were historical subjects, they were able to I intervene and change things. Um, but, uh, for example, on the horizon then, there weren't issues like uh, ecological issues. Um, there weren't um, other kinds of issues that are very much present today and may, may lead, and what probably Bauman would talk about, liquid society, so everything is much more diluted, if you wish. And so, why, as I mentioned earlier, the capacity to um, identify with a cause and have a collective identity, for, that was, in a way, simpler in a way, I would think, at the time, or at least we, uh, yeah, I would say that. Now, regarding women, um, I think also it's a very complex situation. Um, um, as I showed with some of the images, uh, in the case of uh, Spain under the Franco dictatorship, it was the oppression of women was so clear by law and also through the discourse on women that that uh, facilitated, if you wish, the rebellion of women against the imposition not just of the laws, which they did want to change, obviously, but also um, against the role and the model of women and their role in society. Um, there was a point when it was thought that domesticity, this discourse and practice of domesticity, that meant that women had to engage with the family work and were identified through motherhood and reproduction, that that came directly from the Franco regime, okay? However, it is also very clear that the, this gender system, which was installed in the 19th century, the modernization of society, that is in all European societies. And I would actually probably make the argument that it was less visible and more subtle in countries like France or even the UK and other countries. It was so obvious in the case of Spain, that imposition and discrimination of women, that in a way it was easier for women to challenge that. And I think that's one of the explanations of the uh, rapidity with which women changed uh, in, in the first years of the transition and the whole uh, structure of the gender order or part of it uh, under Franco uh, was, was challenged at least. Uh, and what I have argued is that the fem feminism and the women's movement managed to um, 
to somewhat modify the political cultures of the transition in order to include women's rights, reproductive rights at the time, which have, what, what would have been probably more difficult in other societies. Does, in practice, the other thing is how society changes or not. And it is true that although there has been um, immense changes in uh, a number of issues regarding uh, women's role in society, feminism, male and female identity. Um, uh, obviously, this has not been solved, and we do know about occult discriminatory pa practices, both in the labor market, in the home, um, and it is much more difficult to make them obvious and evident. It was much easier under Franco, if you wish. No? Uh, and this, I think, has to do with um, the politics of identity and gender identities in society. Um, female identity that was constructed relating women to nature, reproduction, motherhood. That was challenged and changed. However, the notions of male identity have not been subject to such challenges. Um, uh, so, um, male identity that was conformed in 19th century on the basis of virility, sexuality, but also on being the breadwinner. Um, today, um, 21st century, given the situation of the precariousness of work, the lack of stability in work, um, the capacity for the, the male, the man to provide for the family economy based on his own salary, um, this, is, this is gone. In other words, the major pillars of uh, male identity, to my mind, have, have changed, and yet there has not been a reflection on that. Um, and what does this lead us to? It does lead to the um, reminiscence and continued practices, if you wish, that within the sphere of the family, it's much more difficult to, to change some, um, some practices. Um, uh, and that may lead to uh, what you have said, particularly among the very young generations, this is what we're finding in the schools, that there is a degree of male control of, of uh, women, of young women, very young women, but on the other hand, uh, I'm fortunate enough to work and teach at the university where I have male and female students, and, um, and I am optimistic about that generation of younger males um, coming in and questioning the notions of masculinity and male power that had been inculcated and they had lived through, and questioning that, and, and, I, and in that sense, I am an optimist. Um, but of course, um, we all know that systems are established Systems are redirected, refounded, reformulated, reappropriated to ensure continuity. And this, to some extent, has also happened in regarding gender relations. And I think it's up to us as historians to identify the mechanisms, to my mind, are no longer legal, or it's not a question of order and justice, but these are cultural mechanisms that are still uh, happening through the media, through other, many other. Uh, areas or arenas that um, ensure the continuity of traditional gender roles or the modification or the slowness in their modification or that they may emerge in a different way. And that I think is, has happened in so many times in, in history. I, I just would like to add that uh, 1968 in, in uh, uh, global perspective was um, much, which was already told, um, uh, much uh, immersed in uh, great ideologies. For um, those uh, in in France, in Paris, we saw those um, uh, neo-Marxism, we saw uh, Trotskyism, we saw uh, portrait of Che Guevara, Ho Chi Minh, uh, who else, uh, Mao Tse Tung, and all those uh, great ideologies uh, Actually, they got bankrupted, so there is no great narratives uh, promising uh, uh, easy solutions, and there is no uh, the most the one most Im very important difference is there is no more framework of Cold War. 1968 happened within the framework of Cold War, and the the great fear which underpinned uh, was underpinning those societies, the great fear of nuclear Armageddon. It wasn't uh, voiced directly in 1968, but I, th I think, I, I feel it was somehow there, the, the great fear of, of the global war uh, between uh, uh, nuclear empires. It's still valid because we got still nuclear empires that are on collision course, 
perhaps more now than in 1968, but the fear that the people that... Uh, are not aware of the fact people perhaps these days and th there is no much more those of those global of those cold war framework within societies okay so thank you very very much to the three speakers uh, we really hope that uh, your presentations will be inspiring the youth uh, nowadays for, <laughs> for to struggle for at the end to struggle for the freedoms and and and, and and the civil rights that are being um, that are in danger within the EU also nowadays. Um, just to add that the, the, the presentations have been recorded in video and will be available in our website. Uh, also part of this project, which is a European project with different partners, uh, one of the outcomes will be a publication, will be a book published in English, including the presentations of, of our guests today and, and some other articles. And the third outcome of this project will be a traveling exhibition, an exhibition on the 68 in, in whole Europe, but specifically in these three countries. The exhibition will be open in uh, Ljubljana in the, in the coming month, then it will travel to Warsaw, and finally it will finish here in Barcelona. So if we follow us uh, in our social media and, and, and through our newsletter, you'll be informed about the place and the dates of the exhibition here in Barcelona. And one more thing that maybe our uh, colleague Fernanda, the, uh, the journalist, can inform us about this uh, contest of uh, Instagram. If you are using social media and if you are using Instagram, you, can, you are all invited to participate in it. And you just need to put this hashtag in search of freedom 1968. And um, the idea is taking nowadays pictures of whatever is happening in, around you, in your countries, in, in, in the struggles on the street, uh, the, the women's march, uh, whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you add this hashtag, you'll be, in the, um, you'll be uh, participating in this competition and th there are some prizes for the winners. It's uh, an e-book, right? Uh, Fernanda, is it an e-book, a very nice one, offered by our uh, Slovenian uh, um, partner. So we invite you to, to take part to, to the contest. And a big applause for all of them.